On this week's Carrier App, we speak with Huawei to discuss utilizing hybrid approaches to increase rural broadband access. All right, thanks for joining us on this week's Carrier Wrap. Uh, I'm your host, Dan Meyer, Editor-in-Chief at RCR Wireless News. And uh, this week, we are joined by uh, George Reed and Bill Gursky from Huawei to talk a bit about uh, some of the challenges that are facing rural carriers in terms of mobile broadband deployments and what Huawei is doing to kind of help those carriers out. So, hey, guys, thanks for joining us this week. We, uh, we appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Very good. Well, maybe start with George. If you want to give uh, maybe a little overview of, of Huawei and kind of how you guys have been working with uh, some of these rural carriers in terms of their... Uh, their mobile mobile uh, broadband deployments. Sure, Dan, no problem. So uh, we've been engaged with uh, the rural market here in the U.S. for a number of years. Uh, what we've focused on doing is taking the the innovative spirit and the customer centricity uh, aspects that we focus on with these customers and bringing particular solutions to the marketplace that they need. Uh, the rural carriers are in a unique position in the marketplace, and and that. Um, they're no longer necessarily just a pure play in, in one area of technology, uh, but they require uh, lots of different products and solutions to satisfy their needs. As you know, there's issues with densities, geography, topology, uh, and, and the issues they all face in trying to uh, increase the bandwidth uh, that in reaching their customers in, in rural America. So, Huawei has a great solution portfolio to offer them that covers everything from wireless to, to optical to um, millimeter wave, anything they need, we have it in the portfolio. And uh, that offers our, our customers uh, any type of solution at the price point they need to satisfy their needs to service their customers in their marketplaces. So it's a good combination of win-win with our customers and of course with, with Huawei and what we're trying to do and build in the marketplace. Makes sense. Now Bill, maybe you can provide some insight, I guess, into maybe some of the customers you were working with in terms of kind of the, these deployments out there with the rural carriers. Well, and I, it's a great question. I think one of the, ch there's a number of challenges that we have out there. And I, if we want to reflect back on this, I think what you're starting to see is the universal service funds are starting to go away on a lot of the rural carriers. So the challenges for them are is how do we compete effectively and how do we hold on to our subscriber base? And most importantly, how do we hold on even to our employees? So as you start to lose your universal service money, you're losing maybe 16 to $18 a month that was free money to you from the government to subsidize, of course, landlines. Well, the landlines aren't in play anymore, so they're switching a lot of the money over to being able to use broadband services. So as they're starting to do that, they're going to have to, in order to get the subsidies for the USF funding, they're going to have to build out broadband. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge. Uh, and how do you do that? How do you get speed to market? How do you accomplish what you're trying to do? And how fast do you want to do it? So we're, we've been out there now about two years. We're always pretty new to the market out in the tier three markets. Um, around the world, of course, we're number one when you look at optics and you look at LTE and look at a lot of stuff but in the u.s we're fairly new and especially to the tier three market i spent about five years at the national rural telecommunications cooperative association the nrtc and i worked with over 1500 utilities and that was about 800 telcos tier three and the 700 rural electrics so i'm i kind of know a lot of the people that are out there i know their challenge i know what they want to do and so we go out there, and Huawei, as I said, is a new player. And so it's it, for me to sit down and sit and say, what are your challenges? What are your opportunities? Do you have the funding available that you're going to want to do? So we've been out there two years, as I said, and we've been pretty successful. We've brought in a number of companies. And when I sit down and I say, what is your number one? What are your three or four challenges? What pain points do you have? And they really say distance, density, and terrain. Mm -hmm. So... When you're in rural America, and, and I don't know, I, I'm sure you've been out there quite a bit, it's a long drive and there's not a lot of people. So how do you get out there and do you run fiber? And what is the challenge of running fiber throughout a whole area out in rural areas? Well, it's near impossible, to be honest with you. So you really got to pick the areas you want to do 
And then what we subscribe to and we, we recommend to a lot of the rural tier three telcos is why don't you use maybe a hybrid approach and, and really go in there and say, okay, do you have any existing cable plant that maybe is antiquated, it's old, it needs upgraded? Well, Huawei has a great CMTS uh, uh, device that we can use, and it's the Doxus 3.0. And what it does is it takes a lot of the old antiquated cable plant, and now you can get that antiquated, that maybe you're getting 5 to 10 meg, now you can get upwards of 50 to 100 meg, and now you've, you've really got some speeds that make it capable. So maybe you can clean up the old cable plant. And then number two, look at fixed wireless. Mm -hmm. Look at a lot of the areas, especially in the outer areas, that maybe you've got some uh, 365 signal, you've got some 2.5 from the educational stuff, are those available for you to use? Mm -hmm. Then we'll, we will come in and we'll help you with your cable plant and we'll also help you with your fixed wireless plant. So now you've got speed to market. Now you can go out there and start to get subscribers at a very low cost, start to bring revenue in and then develop your plan for fiber to the home and build out where the homes are most, where they're all congregated in one area and build out to those markets. So we can come in, one thing about Huawei is we can come in with a triple play approach, mm -hmm. whether it's the hybrid cable, whether it's the wireless or fiber to the home. And we, once we sit down with them, we show them we can do it at a pretty low cost mm -hmm. because of how many customers we have around the world. And we try to share those costs with everybody in the tier three markets. It's pretty amazing when they sit down and compare, compare us to some of the competitors that are currently out there doing the work. So I think those are some of the challenges you know, uh, a couple of the markets we started out with in Hermiston, Oregon, and out in Walla Walla, Washington. Mm -hmm. And we just recently are wiring up Hargrave Communications for all of Hilton Head Island, um, which was a very competitive bid for us. We had uh, eight other vendors that were after the market. And after uh, 30 days of looking at our equipment and everybody else's, uh, the, the executive staff of Hargrave chose Huawei to the end-to-end -end solution to build out the whole entire market. And we're pretty excited about that. That's going to be our showcase in the U.S. for right now for the Tier 3 markets. We feel we've overcome a lot of their objectives that they needed to do. We think we have the right equipment. They're using the triple approach, too. They're using hybrid cable. They're using wireless. They're using our microwave. And they're building out our fiber to the home. So it's very challenging, but we think that Huawei is the right answer for these guys. Makes sense. And obviously, like you guys mentioned, I mean, obviously the cost part of this is always a big part for rural carriers. Like you said, the USF funding uh, is definitely uh, shrinking a little bit. Uh, so it's, that's challenging these carriers more. But I guess as, as the carriers are looking at their current approach, I mean, where do you see them at today? I mean, it, it seems like a lot of the, maybe the larger rural guys have already rolled out LTE. Uh, they're starting to already generate some revenues on those. Some of the smaller tier three are still in that process. I guess as you look at the market in general, I mean, are we are we still in this kind of deployment phase of all of this, or are we kind of moving uh, beyond you know a lot of talk and and actually moving towards kind of the, the next phase of this of this evolution? I'd like I'd like to believe we're beyond the talk on this. <laughs> we're seeing more and more activity on this. But as I uh, I just met recently with executives from the NRTC, yeah. and I asked them what their belief is and what their research shows on what percentage of rural America has built out fiber, and they said it's around ten percent right now. So that's a huge opportunity for the vendors that are in this market. And I think, you know, the biggest question is, is the financing. I mean, to yeah. build out these markets and how much it's going to take. And that's why I recommend, you know, looking at your cable plant and looking at your wireless and building up a revenue base, you know, that you can build out your fiber to the home. But if you can't, then one of the best ways to look at it is look at Huawei. I mean, we, uh, when we looked at building hard grade, they came back and they, they were, totally impressed to how much under we were to their budget and what they wanted to accomplish. So we think, you know, given us an opportunity to go head to head with the competition, we truly believe our solutions, you know, having, you know, 77,000 R and D people at Huawei. Uh, I always like to tell a, a rural CEO, look out over your window and imagine 77,000 research and development people working for you, Mr. CEO. Imagine what Huawei can accomplish for you. So you're getting all the benefits of this $62 billion company and supporting you with research and development, supporting you with the next generation of fiber to the home, the next generation of wireless, the next generation of DOCSIS 3.1 coming up in the, next, in the first quarter. Mm -hmm. Imagine all this coming to a rural telco and having that at a great price. We think that's a huge advantage for a rural telco, and we're happy to partner with them.
Got it. I guess, I guess you need different challenges in terms of operators that do have that broader base, whether it's fiber, uh, wireline assets already, as opposed to some of the more wireless uh, centric operators uh, in the rural areas who maybe don't have quite as deep of a portfolio to, to, to dig into. I guess, are you seeing a different approach uh, when they're kind of moving to the market? Are you looking at more wireless backhaul for some of those guys who maybe just have wireless assets or what's kind of different approach you're seeing or different challenges you're seeing depending upon the, I guess, the carrier's assets? George? Yeah, mm -hmm. so the, the tier two wireless guys, uh, they typically have either um, you know, 2G, 3G solutions. Yeah. So some of them are midstream in terms of upgrading to LTE, mm -hmm. establishing and are continuing the roaming relationships with other carriers. Uh, Volte's on the horizon for them as well. But what we're finding, they, they also need a hybrid approach. They, they need backhaul solutions, yeah. um, particularly as they upgrade their plan to support LTE or, or, or Volte. Um, so if they can drive fiber deep, they'll do that. Uh, if not, they, there's potentially cable out there. We also have a full slate of microwave solutions that, that they can utilize as well. And, and an interesting point, Dan, is some of these companies are also looking at um, adding in a fixed wireless component. Mm -hmm. So not only do they have a mobility offering, but they're also looking at, at the 3.5 and the 2.5 for a, a fixed wireless uh, additional service offering. Got it, yeah. So now... So now they can provide a higher bandwidth delivery to the home in a case where perhaps their cellular coverage doesn't quite quite reach, uh, or they want to drop in a community that's that's still part of their overall service area, uh, but they want to drop in a, a higher bandwidth broadband capability than potentially what they can offer over their cellular service. So we're really seeing this nice blend of technologies and capabilities that enable them again to to drive their revenue stream upwards with new services. Interesting. Oh, good. I think to add on, if you add on to that, really a lot of the world telcos, one of their biggest challenges, of course, is video. Mm -hmm. You know, what they're going to do with video, whether it's a, a shared head end, whether it's an IPTV, you know, what they're trying to do, or, you know, are they going to use over the top? Are they going to try to bring Netflix in? So some of the challenges for these guys is saying, what, what, what kind of triple play do I want to have? Is it a video with a broadband service? Do I keep the landline in? Quite frankly, a lot of people in rural America still use their landline services. So I think the challenges for them is where do they get their programming? Is it through the NRTC? Is it through NCTC? Who do they get their programming from? How do they triple play this? And how do they maximize going out to this? Because I think the, the number one goal, of course, right now is broadband. That's, mm -hmm. that's going to be a revenue source. I think for a rural telco, Video, if you're going to use a head end or IPTV, is a loss leader. I really believe that not many telcos, unless you're sitting on more than 20,000 customers, video probably is not a revenue source that you're looking at, but it's a staple for you to, to solidify the triple play. Mm -hmm. So I think when you look at the broadband, if you can get speeds upwards to a gig and using fiber, I think what the rural telcos are trying to accomplish is a couple of different things. One, they're trying to have a better economy for rural America. They really believe that they want to have the same services, whether it's a gigabit of service or 500 meg, but they, they look across, and if you're in Hermiston, Oregon, they're looking at Portland, and they're looking at Seattle, and these guys are getting Google services of one gig. Well, imagine if you're a rural telco, and you can provide a gigabit of service, and you can get the city to support you and the mayor and the chamber of commerce and the city to say, listen, we're going to support you. Now, what have you done? You're going to let the younger people are going to stay home. They're going to leave. They're going to go to college, but they're going to come back and they're going to build businesses in the community. I really believe that the high speed broadband Internet is going to be a staple for those rural communities to make it strong again. They, they won't stay if they don't get a really good signal on that level. And, I, and from what I hear from the CEOs, that's the number one goal is to be able to really to provide health care and to provide all this stuff to the Internet so that the people will stay in their community. They'll grow strong. But without that strong broadband access, I, th I think it, it's not going to happen. Interesting. Yeah. And obviously it does seem like there are kind of two tracks that rural carriers are kind of going down here. It's, it's that they obviously have to, they have to keep those roaming agreements in place with their nationwide roaming partners. And that's always an important part of this, but also like you guys are saying, it's kind of that services aspect as well, where they're trying to, you know, drive more revenue. I mean, drive a whole different service for themselves. Uh, does it seem like that, that they're focused on any one specific area at this moment? I mean, obviously 
the roaming part, they kind of need to keep that going because their customers do roam and they want to make sure they keep those roaming agreements in place. And a lot of them have partnerships with some of the nationwide guys, you know, sharing spectrum and things like that as well. Uh, but obviously the, the services part is kind of probably the more revenue driver for them, or at least, uh, you know, I'm guessing Jeff is more revenue than a, than a roaming source does. Are you seeing any specific focus from carry, rural carriers right now in terms of where they're trying to, uh, I guess, push their, their investment right now? So yeah, if, if we talk about tier three wireless carriers, so they're, they're looking, as I said earlier, they're all looking to add service capability. Okay. Um, the, the fact that they've upgraded plan from, from 2G, 3G, and now 4G, it enables them to offer enhanced services and, re and really compete in their, in their space. They have to. Okay. They, have to, they have to do this. It's, it's a grow or die kind of uh, phenomenon that's happening. So the fact is now um, what they're seeing is it's not only the, the traditional mobile carrier offering. There's other capabilities now that they can offer in their, in their service area. Mm -hmm. As I say, this, this fixed band with fixed broadband capability of interest to a number of, of folks we're talking to, uh, working with as customers. So that's, that's a nice add-on capability. Um, you have towers already, uh, so now let me add on another wireless service capability. So that's a, that's a great, uh, of great interest. It's a great revenue source mm -hmm. for these companies, uh, something that they didn't necessarily have or even think about having before. But now it's something new on their plate. And then you layer on top of the, the, the broadband service capability, the video, if, if that's the direction they want to head. So there's, there's lots of new and growing opportunities. We didn't even talk about IoT. And that's a whole expansion area for any service provider in the business. So mm -hmm. there, there's a lot more, uh, I call them tools in the toolbox, uh, not only from the products and solutions perspective, but from the service offering and capabilities that, that these uh, uh, operators can offer their customers. Okay, makes sense. And yeah, we'll get to the IoT probably in a second here as well. But uh, I guess maybe in terms of the spectrum part of all this as well, I mean, how, how much of a challenge is this spectrum for these small carriers? I mean, like you mentioned, George, you know, a lot of guys are looking at 2.5 and 3.5 uh, as opportunities for uh, fixed wireless in, in their areas. A lot of them still have some 700 megahertz spectrum in some areas, uh, some refarming of their PCS spectrum and their cellular spectrum as well. I guess how much of a challenge is this spectrum? I mean, there's an auction going on right now, obviously, which uh, some of these guys are participating into. Uh, so we can't get too deep into there, but uh, I guess as you look at kind of the spectrum challenge, what do you what are you seeing out there in terms of these operators trying to I guess tackling that part of their of their business case? Yeah, the, the spectrum, uh, the cost of spectrum is always an issue for for everybody, uh, whether it's a tier one, a tier two, or a tier three. So um, the fact that uh, they they've already bought into some licenses and they're doing the refarming, as as you said, is important uh, because they can free up bandwidth. And, and grow their services capabilities on, on an LTE uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, three five lightly licensed uh, that will come around again here next year with the CBR span another 100 megahertz. That offers a great potential for uh, a number of these operators that, that they can at, at a reasonable cost, we'll say, uh, certainly add in uh, another another spectrum capability. Two fives available for leasing. Yeah. You know, through a, a number of sources, uh, but when you when you come to the big chunks of spectrum, like like 600 megahertz, for example, uh, it may be a little bit too pricey for some of the small guys. But at the same time, there's some very forward-looking operators who are are willing to either work together with other operators, combine their resources. Um, uh, you know, they get some relief from the from the FCC uh, given their size. So uh, it's not out of the question for them. It, it's just not a, a big grab ball. Uh, that perhaps the companies with deeper pockets can do. Yeah, that makes sense. And obviously, too, with, with the multi solutions coming online as well, uh, once those come out, I mean, obviously, that would allow these smaller guys to turn down those 2G and 3G networks because a lot of that still is, is servicing the voice community as well. But once that comes online, I'm guessing that'll be another option for them to kind of maybe go, maybe go back and refarm some of that spectrum to bolster their spectrum uh, portfolio for frailty, I'm guessing. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Volte is a, a great methodology for freeing up spectrum. So, uh, you know, it, it takes investment. There's no question about it. But uh, I believe all of these uh, tier three carriers see that, uh, again, I, I need to invest to stay competitive. I, I need to invest to uh, be able to support roaming capabilities yeah. with our partners. And that's a great source of revenue for them. So they don't want to lose that source of revenue going forward. So it's incumbent upon them to 
to work with companies like Huawei to come up with cost-effective creative solutions so they can so they can build their business. Got it. And I guess I see in terms of the roaming part of it, I know some of the larger nationwide guys have uh, rural programs in place to help out the smaller guys, uh, at least in terms of roaming. Is that driving any sort of uh, deployment plans at this point? Or is that, I mean, is that kind of hit and miss depending on, on the carrier? Or I guess, are you seeing any sort of traction in terms of those things related to what rural carriers are trying to do? I haven't seen that. Yeah. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. You know, I haven't seen as much. I mean, I'm, what I am seeing more and more is um, you have a group like the NRTC owns a company called Telespire, and Telespire is an MVNO, and you're seeing more and more of the world telcos sign on to the MVNO license with Sprint and Verizon, yeah. and using that as a, as a as a tool for their as as George says, that's another tool in their toolbox. So I think there's some good revenue from there. It's very low cost, and uh, you know, Huawei being the uh, third largest uh, smartphone provider. I mean, a lot of the handsets are, are starting, we're starting to see more and more sales through the handsets yeah. of Huawei handsets out there too. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Well, no, I guess now maybe as, as a final kind of topic and wrap up question, looking at, I guess, the IOT and, and the 5G world, <clears throat> excuse me, things like that. I mean, are, are those, I guess, are you, are you hearing a lot of uh, uh, attention placed on those right now? I mean, are, are those, you know, are carriers saying, hey, I want to do LTE, but I know 5G is coming as well. You know, do I hold off on doing LTE at this point? Do I make sure that my LTE solution is forward compatible with whatever 5G is going to be and whatever this IoT world is going to be. I guess, what are you seeing out there in terms of, of what 5G and IoT are doing to, uh, I guess, the impact on unreal carriers today? Yeah, I mean, there's no question 5G is coming, but uh, it's quite some time before it'll hit the rural market. Sure. So uh, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, tell any tier three to, to our, our rural carrier to slow down on their LTE deployments, uh, for sure because LTE will be a staple for quite some time going forward. Uh, you know, 5G, it's obviously in the news, it's coming. Um, you know, standards are rolling, but uh, you know, when do those standards come into play when you have fully standard-based mm -hmm. uh, based, uh, solutions? It, it's still a few years from now. Um, we know there'll be some pre-commercial launch or pre-standard launch yeah. activity. That's, that's in the news too as well. So uh, from the 5G perspective, it, it's, still, it's still early, uh, a little too early for, we'll say, the rural operators. Too early, IoT on, really, but we'll leave it at that, but go ahead. <laughs> IoT, on the other hand, offers a great option uh, for, for these carriers. Um, you know, look at how many companies are bringing on home-based security solutions as a, a, re a revenue add um, or home automation. You know, these are capabilities that, that they can do. Um, and they can offer their, their customer base. Um, you know, every day I read another article about some new IoT capability, you know, health monitoring, uh, agriculture. Um, public safety. Pets, public safety. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. So it's just a matter of uh, does, the, does the operator want to invest in that? Mm -hmm. uh, do they have the resources to invest in that? Do they have a solution that matches their community needs? Um, I'd say yes, they all need to take a look at it and, and understand what's there and what's available uh, and then build a business plan to support a new service offering perhaps in, in their area. Interesting. And yeah, Bill, I don't know if you're doing maybe the same kind of thing in terms of IoT out there. I'm guessing you're, again, you're in contact with a lot of these guys out there. I'm sure you're hearing, at least they're talking about this, at least want to know what's happening in terms of what they should do for IoT, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's the same thing George said, so I'd, I'd just be repeating it, but I, I think they're looking at everything that they can do. Um, they're looking at solar. They're looking at the smart home right now, uh, what they can do. So they, their challenge is they, they lost the universal service funding money. How do they replace that money? And how do they keep the amount of, uh, of employees they have? Because it's really tough to continue on with the same employees that you had out there and to re retain them as, a, as your personnel. So I think that's a challenge that to bring on new products and new services. The challenge is to have the right people out there and to and maintain the quality of life out in the rural parts of the country. Very interesting. Well, guys, definitely appreciate the insights today. I know whenever I cover uh, the rural guys, I love talking to those carriers out there. They're, they're really kind of, a, you know, really feet on the ground kind of people and you really hear what's happening out there. So obviously it's good to hear uh, a lot of the development going on that they're looking at LTE. I know a lot of them have already rolled out LTE, but uh, there's still a lot of work happening out there too. So it's uh, like a lot of interesting action out there, but uh, definitely appreciate the great insight on the topic today, you guys. Thanks so much for the time and uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon on the topic. 
Well, thanks for watching this week's show and make sure to check us out again next week when we speak with Cap Gemini Consulting to discuss what steps regional providers need to take as they fight to survive.